Welcome to Dead Headspace. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Ghana, and all other major platforms, which now includes YouTube. That's right. You can find us on YouTube to watch your favorite episodes from Season 1 and Season 2. I'm your host, Patrick R. McDonough. Unfortunately, my co-host, Brent LaFaro, could not be with us today. He will be back next week. Filling in for him is Cassie Daly. Say hi, Cassie. Hello. And today we're talking with the author of Black Mount- Mountain, the Isaiah Coleridge series, and quite a few more books, Laird Barron. Hi, Laird. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Um, before we jump into the baseline question, how are you doing today, sir, after yesterday's <laughs> unprecedented uh, event? I... Uh... I'm here, just like I think everybody else, just sort of uh, shell shocked over the last few months about how things are going. Absolute craziness. Says it. Do you? Now, I'm not sure I've heard your writing process before. Do you write every day, or or do you have a, a schedule? Uh, I write every day. My schedule. Uh, I try to be consistent with it, but basically, what works for me, my sleep schedule is so strange that I, I work for a, a couple hours take some time off, do other things, work for a couple hours. So I, I probably, I probably write for six or so hours every single day, Mm. but it's scattered throughout the, throughout the, uh, an 18 hour, uh, waking cycle. It's kind of how I do it. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Uh, Cassie, you want to take it away? Yeah. So, um, the first question that we normally ask is pretty much standard across, uh, you know, all of our guests. So I want you to tell me a little bit about what got you into horror in general. And if you want to, you know, talk about the crime stuff as well, you can. But um, I just want to know, like, the kind of gory details about what got you into the spooky <laughs> stuff. <laughs> um, well, I started writing at a very young age, uh, about five years old. It was before I could really even read. I, I barely knew my alphabet. <laughs> and I was driven to write. I just... Uh, that was something that was part of my DNA, I suppose. Uh, and I wrote throughout uh, my early, my ad, you know, into my late teenage years, actually. I wrote three or four novels and definitely uh, around a million words of fiction. And I would say about 80% of that was fantasy, maybe even 90% fantasy, science fiction, and some kind of hybrid of the two. Very little horror. But uh, one thing that I was always good at uh, was telling my brother's scary stories. We lived in a pretty remote setting. Our parents were gone quite frequently. And uh, I liked to scare the living crap out of them with scary stories. That was uh, <laughs> my my version of being responsible older brother. Uh, and then as years went by, uh, in my late 20s, I got back into writing heavily again. Uh, and I was writing fantasy and science fiction once again. Uh, I wrote a fantasy novel. But as the novel progressed, it got darker and darker and darker until it was pretty much a horror novel just in a in a high fantasy setting and so i ended up trunking that novel but while but while i was sort of stewing over edits and stuff to decompress i wrote a horror story which turned out to be my first professionally published uh, piece of fiction and that was a story called shiva open your eye which is a cosmic horror kind of an homage to lovecraft at the time i was like you know i even wrote it with the 10 cent um, the 10 cent words and whatnot. And I got a really good reception. So I wrote another story called Old Virginia, uh, another story called Hour of the Cyclops. So I, I wrote these three stories fairly close, you know, in succession. And they did and they did well. And I said, huh, this maybe this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And uh, that's basically how I got into horror. What's really interesting for me about it professionally is that I was sitting with Gordon Van Gelder pretty early on in my career. This is probably like 2003 or 2004. And he was just asking me about what I planned to do with my writing. Because at that point I'd sold three or four stories. And he said, are you gonna continue? I said, yeah, I've always written. I just, I've just now started trying to sell stuff. So, you know, this is, seems like a great, a great combo. And he said, well, I I introduce you to people or I I describe you as a horror writer. because that's kind of the niche that you fit in, in my magazine. Uh, do you, are you comfortable with that? Some people don't like that. And I said, no, I, I, you know, I was kind of isolated from the literary community at that time. And so I, I had very little uh, conception of all the, the infighting that goes on amongst the genres and, and, and the rules and the etiquette and all the protocol and all that. And I said, yeah, hell yeah, I'm a horror writer. That's fine. He said, great. 
And he said, you know, you really should, until you establish yourself, stick with the genre. Write a few more stories. And he, because he gave me some cautionary tales about authors who skipped around. He said, if you care about establishing yourself and kind of gaining this identity, he goes, and then later on, you can write whatever you want. He goes, look at Stephen King. He goes, but because Stephen King turns into Stephen King, it's not Stephen King, the horror author anymore, it's Stephen King. And he said, other writers, obviously less famous writers, have done that. And so that's pretty much how I develop my, my career as a horror writer. Um, but what I've discovered is, is that it really, it, on top of just being, you know, good at it or good enough to sell, that really is my, um, it's not something I read a lot growing up uh, compared to crime or some of the other genres, but I really do love writing horror. It, um, it sneaks into stuff, even when I'm doing, doing crime fiction, the horror sneaks in. That's really cool. What, what about crime? What, uh, you said that, you just said that you read a lot of crime. Was right. there one, was there one or a series of of crime <laughs> authors that you really took to at a young age? Grew up reading. Um, this funny thing is, when I was younger, up, up until probably in my teens, I didn't really, except for really famous authors, I didn't pay attention to who I was reading. We had trunks and trunks of books, and I, you know, obviously I would look at, oh, it's a Frank Irby smut you know it's harold robbins more smut <laughs> but generally speaking i didn't really i didn't really um this would sound really odd but i didn't really pay attention to who i was reading unless it was the famous a famous writer so i have discovered like in my 30s 40s and now 50s that wow i read this book a long time ago uh but the stuff so i read a lot of stuff that i that, that i that if i ran across again i go yeah that's part of the reason that i became the writer that i am is because i read read people like this these house authors and whatnot uh but so I want to give them a little credit, uh, even though I can't always name them. But as far as uh, authors that really stuck with me when I was growing up, it would be people like uh, Chandler, uh, Leonard. That's when I was really, really young, reading guys like that. Uh, John D. McDonald at a very young age. Uh, and then later on, um, you know, when, when I was in my late teens throughout my and then, and then from you know into my 20s and 30s, I read I got into, El, you know, um, Elroy and um some of the more modern authors, like today I'm reading uh, J. Todd Scott, for example, who, who's a really great writer out of Putnam. Is there any other crime? Did you read Black Top Wasteland? I have not read that yet, but I've heard nothing. I've heard nothing but wonderful things about it. I'm, I'm pretty excited. And That's... also I'm, I'm Twitter friends with uh, Cosby. And I'm really excited that, that he's <laughs> had such great success. You, you guys are fun to just generally be a spectator of because you both are so, smart sons of bitches. And then <laughs> what, you tend to say stuff that I, I kind of want to project about mainly so f recently. It's been, you know, modern ev events, but I, I love it because there's no combat in it. If you have a brain, there's no way to combat what you guys are saying because you, you nail it. And that's what you guys do in your writing. Like with Sean, with Blacktop Wasteland, um, it's just it's gritty. It's there's no fat. There's no fat with a blood standard either. It, it's just it's exciting. It, it it's a run. It's a race or what have you. And uh, there's hints of horror in both of them, in some extents. I could see it going further. Cassie, when we had Sean on, was talking about how if he pushed the limit a little bit further with Blacktop Wasteland, she could have totally saw it being a a horror instead of a crime. Um, now with Blood Standard, I kind of. I'm curious, did did you go into that series, or let's go back to just book one. Um, did you go into that thinking, this is going to be a crime, or did you just say, I like this character, I want to see where it goes? No, it was extremely uh, calculated. The, the character wasn't calculated. The character, I, I've said it several times now he, he basically is the guy who won the audition because i knew that i was going to write kind of a hard a hard edged or a hard boiled crime novel and so that part was calculated you know it was not going to contain any kind of over supernatural element there there might be some occult elements or mystical elements but within the realm of what you might expect someone to believe or encounter in real life uh but coleridge himself the, the person that ended up, you know, helming the series was somebody that kind of surprised me. But uh, he, he essentially is just sort of a synthesis of all of the of the tough guy or, or hard bark characters that I've written for the last 20 years. You know, I have several veins of writing and one of them is undeniably 
the over the top, uh, almost archetypal or or conventional uh, hard boiled character. Usually guys, but there are there are a couple of women that uh, have have kind of sort of started edging into that scenario for me, like Jessica Mace. But they do they occupy this this sort of a, of a classical realm of people who solve problems, you know, with with their physicality as much as they do their brains, and. But there's a variety of those. With even within that, I, I was talking to somebody not that long ago and saying, you know, if all I ever did for the rest of my career was write stories about the various types of tough, sort of, you know, classic, classically speaking, tough characters, I would never run out of different characters to write about because there are variations on that theme that are just, I won't say endless, but probably endless in my lifetime, and. So, so that's not a surprise, but just who he who he turned out to be is a bit of a surprise. And um, I succeeded. Uh, I wanted to be able. To, I wanted to prove to myself more than anyone that I could just sit down and write pretty much anything I wanted to write. I one time I you know, I challenged my I challenged my agent and said maybe I'll write a romance one of these days. <laughs> I said no, don't do that. I keep writing crime. <laughs> but I, I feel like I could. And the writing a very straightforward narrative because blood standard i'm le- that's me learning how to write a different kind of first of all write a novel i haven't at that point i've only written a couple novels um professionally so that's really you know that's really early on in my writing my, my novel writing career i'm a i'm, I'm accomplished fiction short fiction uh, writer as much as probably i'm going to get but i still have a long way to go reaching my ceiling as a as a as a uh, a novelist so I kept it simple and I kept it straightforward, but I also set a goal. And the goal was, no, this is going to follow the rules of the genre and then I'll, I'll try to make it my own. And so I'm very happy with that. The, the other two, of course, are different. So that was your first attempt at writing a hard-boiled crime book? A straightforward one, yeah. <laughs> you know, with the beginning, middle, and... Yeah. You know, fo- following... Obviously, I've written lots and lots of stories that are crime or noir-inflected. Yeah. But it's a, it is different. There's no comparison for me. There's no comparison between short fiction, even novellas do not compare to the act of writing a novel. I actually think short fiction for me is tougher, but they're different. They're, they're completely different disciplines that just have, they are narratives that contain words. And that's about as close as they get. I don't think that writing short fiction prepared me to, to write novels, except in best practices, it's the sense of best practices, such as discipline, you finish what you start, you know how to edit, you know, you have an idea of developing themes. But as far as like, um, it's a marathon compared to a sprint. So th- th- there's a world of difference between the two. So I've been staring at the poster behind you basically the whole time that I've been watching you. So now I want to know what sort of movies have influenced you and your writing specifically. Uh, <laughs> <coughs> well, you know what's interesting is I would have to say, uh, speaking to, to cinema or the other arts, um, you know, uh, literature, music, whatever, uh, the visual arts, I'm often, and I would have to say that most of my inspiration comes from non from non horror. I feel like I'm better as a horror writer because horror is probably like third or fourth or fifth even on my influence uh, as a whole, taken as a whole. Uh, so I do love a lot of horror movies. Like The Thing is one of my very favorite. Carpenter's The Thing is one of my favorite horror movies. Although I think it's good enough to basically you could just say it's a great movie. You don't really have to even define it its genre. Uh, but I grew up and continue to enjoy, I like crime fiction or, you know, crime movies. Um, I watched a lot of Bogart movies growing up. Uh, I really like, um, these days though, I'm really into uh, TV more than I am film. I, I, I watch far more Netflix or uh, um, get it from the library. I'll get like HBO series and stuff like that because I love how character is developed over an arc. Now stuff that a movie, a movie's good at one thing, the t- TV series, if it's done well, Wow, you can really get into the characters. So I highly enjoy Justify, The Shield. Those were a couple um, long-running series that I liked. But I'm really into a lot of non uh, non English stuff now. I'm really getting into like stuff from Sweden and uh, you know France and things like that. I'm watching this. Um, actually, I set it aside, but I think it's called Ma- uh, Mant- Mantid. Uh, it's about uh, it's a it's a French thriller, a kind of like a Silence of the Lambs kind of a thing. 
So I, I highly enjoy that. Um, Angel Heart, as far as just sticking straight straight to movies, Angel Heart was a big was a big influence on me. Um, I think the cinematography and just the attention to detail uh, cinematically uh, is is and also the foley the foley work on Angel Heart really really stuck with me. I take stuff from movies or like I said from other visual arts. And try to translate that into my own stories, like how, you know, the sound of the sound, the sound effects. Somebody's chewing gum, or they're lighting a cigarette, or whatever. How do you convey that, or what don't you try to convey as as a writer? A lot of times, it's what you leave out. So when I'm watching a movie, I have to say, uh, a lot of times I'm watching it as much for picking up on cues and ta- and techniques as I am in uh, pure enjoyment. Yeah, that. I can't remember the book that I read, but uh, I, when I first started writing myself, I read a lot of you know how tos, and one of them said that basically when you look at your daily life as if it were being narrated, you're thinking of as you just said, how would you describe the texture of this? How would you describe your senses? How would you describe someone walking by? How's their volume when they're whispering or talking? It makes life so much more interesting, especially the boring parts, because it's actually uh, <laughs> it actually makes it not so boring after all. So that that's uh, that's pretty neat, man. Because I I never thought of that until I read that in whatever that book was. But it for you know for any new writer that may be listening, that I think that's kind of something you're like, oh yeah, that that's a good point. Um, Cassie, did you have anything else on on this subject? Um, I just think it's really cool that you, a lot of the people that we ask that, like they have these specific things that they can point to in their past that they're like, this is what made me love horror. This is why I do this. And you're just like, dude, I fell into it. Like, I don't know. It just started happening and it worked out. And I think that's really cool because that's like, it's very organic. It's not something like intentional. Like you didn't intentionally go out to do that. Like it just happened, which I don't know. I think it takes a lot of talent to be able to do something accidentally almost that people love and that are like whoa that's great you should keep doing this thing that's so cool that's really i appreciate that that you you know sort of zeroing in on the organic part because that's how should i put this i used to describe my writing process as and and there's still some truth to this but say 10 or 12 years 13 years ago about the time i came out with my first collection uh i was talking i believe to jeff vandermeer and he asked me to describe my my writing process and you know, just in general terms. And I said, you know, I, I look at it like a, a shortwave radio operator that you're trying to, uh, you know, you're trying to get signal out of static and that's, and then transcribe it. That's kind of how I, and, and then, and so that my creative, the, the creative aspect is how I translate, not so much the original idea. I don't know if we even have any original ideas, but I get these, um, you know, dreams or listening to a conversation, whatever. But the analogy is it's it's like these little ghost signals coming through and mo- it's mostly static, but every now and then there's a burst of something semi-intelligible. And then my job is, is to transcribe it and then edit it into and add my own interpretation to it because it's not always coherent. And so I'm kind of like this translator. And that's how I used to sort of feel about my writing. And to some, de- some degree I, I do, but it's gotten a lot more complicated for me because I'm juggling a lot more creatively than I used to. I used to just brute force my way through through stories. And by that, I mean, they had subtext or they tried to have some sort of thematic unity or something or unity of effect or something like that. But I pretty much didn't think about it. I just bowled my way through from beginning, middle, you know, and, and then I would suture it. I would suture the 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 um, the action scenes or the set pieces together later and and there's nothing wrong with that but that was just how i how i did it these days i actually i actually am a lot stronger because i've been doing this for a long time and i've developed the psychological musculature to or the creative musculature to have endurance and stamina and more strength more more skill and so i do try to vary my approach but also even within a story is to be constantly rotating the more and more plates and doing more things and then the trick is is that nobody can see that hopefully um i mean i think that's the that's the true secret of a really great writer the people that i admire you can't tell how much they're juggling until you go back it just looks simple and you go back and you go wow there's a lot more stuff going on in here than i ever dreamed and this is the fifth time i've read this book 
But to the or question of or, or you know being organic, these days I actually look at a lot of my process as I have a seed of an idea and I'll write it down. I might even write a page uh, that gets thrown away later, but I'll write a page and I look at that almost like pouring water on the seed, uh, and then and then just walk away from it. I've had stories at this point. I've walked away for 15 years and then went back and boom, finished them in a few days or a few weeks. And the reason that I couldn't do it before then, because I'll go back multiple times over the years and go, nope, not ready. It's because I've learned to just not force anything, just let just let it be. And that's an organic process. It literally, the story matures on its own. And then it it's very similar to the whole idea of um, translating earlier, right? This is just another version of it. Instead of sifting through signals that I have no control over, I just have to wait for them to come. I have to wait for this thing to grow so that I can harvest it or cut it out of or cut it out of the morass that it's buried in or deliver it. <laughs> um, and that so, but it all is kind of the same thing, right? There, there's the idea, and then there's the artist, and the artist is. I think some artists feel like they're the in complete control of it. I have much to what what you were saying, Cassie. My feeling is I'm almost like a midwife or a nurse or something. I, I'm like interpreting this stuff and I'm helping it come into the world, but I don't know that I necessarily have a great responsibility for creating it in the first place because it didn't spring from nothing. It came from Martin Cruz Smith, who's another thriller writer I love, or it was Elmore Leonard or Stephen King and Lovecraft and, you know, uh, Shirley Jackson. And so it's, a, it's this amalgamation of all these different people and something that they said or did has created this response in me. My turn. <laughs> I thought, no, I mean, I didn't know if you wanted to say something or if I was going to say something. I couldn't tell because you unmuted. So I was, it's hard with signals. You know, I'm trying to, do you want me to, because I can talk if you want me to talk. You don't want me to talk? Was that a no? Oh, sorry. That was confusing. I meant, <laughs> no, I don't want to, I don't okay, want to okay, interrupt good. you. <laughs> no, I'm good. I've got this. Um, Okay. So back to what you were saying. So I think that's really interesting too, because like I said, we've had a lot of people, we've asked them all these questions, but I, I haven't been struck by as many of the other people as being, um, I don't know, like you seem very self-aware and like maybe that comes with the fact that you've been doing this for a while. So like you said, you've grown and you've learned and you've adapted um, and you've changed over time your methods. And um, I think it's just though, because, like you said, people will want to take control of it and say like, this is my story so I can determine when it gets told. But um, for me, I've only just started writing like this or like last year, I guess, technically, because it's 2021 now. So I'm like, um, I keep calling myself like a baby writer and I'm just learning things as I go, which a lot of this isn't explained. So it's just a lot of um, hearing from other people what works for them. And a lot of the people that I hear from, um, it's sometimes discouraging for me because I'm like, that's not how it is for me. Like, I feel like I get like an idea and then I just kind of sit on it for a really long time. And I, I do, like you said, like I write it down, um, what I just call like a quick outline and then I just let it sit. And then like, I just randomly come back and I'm like, no, nah, I don't know. I don't know what happens here. And then I'll go back again and it could take like a few weeks or it could take like a couple of months and then I can get it done in like a matter of hours just suddenly. And it's not like I've been thinking of it. It's not like it's been like something I've intentionally tried to do. It just happened. And your whole thing, which you just said, just gave me a lot of like faith in my process a little bit because I've been going along with it, trying to trust what I'm doing instead of like what people are telling me to do a little bit. Um, and that sounds like what that's your, that's what you're doing. Like you're, you're like, this is what works for me. This is what I've been doing. This is what I like. And it, you keep doing that and it keeps working, <coughs> which I think is incredible. And that's very inspiring for me. So I hope that that's what happens with me too, eventually. Just if I may just respond to that, that's one thing that I firmly believe and why I, I still give advice because everybody asks, always asks for advice, but I've get, gotten old enough to realize that advice, no matter who's giving it or how accurate it is for them and, and for individuals hearing this advice, it's not for everyone. There, there is no writer that can tell you how to do it. They can only tell you what they've done. And that's kind of my point about this whole organic thing versus interpreting signals thing. Just as an example, I've changed over the last 13 years how I perceive this, and yet there's some truth to both of those things for me still. But if, and there's and there's other things I'm not going to get into that I that I go through with writing. If that's true for me, in other words, if there's all these facets to writing for me, I'm sure that there are either very few facets for other people or more for other people. In other words, there's a variation on this, and that's the only thing I know to be true is that there's a huge difference between best practice 
and mechanics because there are some there are some things that are pretty rote that, that are better than others but they don't have a tendency to be have anything though to do with with deep creative process they have things to do with hey uh, be polite when you send your when you send your query letter in or you know follow the guidelines or things like that um or ultimately if you you know and, and also there's this conflation between writing and publishing and i think that's one of the big the biggest traps that people fall into especially early on when you don't have a lot of stories written or published is that you get in this and it's it's foisted upon us to get into this kind of almost like death spiral. Like I've got to write something to get it published so I can write something else to get it published. I got to have inventory so I can sell it. The reality of it is when you first start, and I'm talking about for just genre fiction, I'm not talking about being a newspaper reporter or something. Uh, if you're writing for publication, you have to keep in mind that publication and writing are related but separate endeavors. And when you first start, you're probably better off, I think, and this is a best practice thing, just focusing on your writing more than you are what's going to happen to your writing. I do think that if you're going to be a published writer, that's your if, if that is your aspiration, and that's usually when I'm talking to people in these kinds of scenarios, I just sort of automatically assume that we're all wanting to be published at some point if we haven't been, or get better if we aren't better, uh, or, or we'd like to be better. The, the, that the bottom line is, though, um, how you get published is different from from how you write, but. If you're going to write for publication, you do have to learn how to synergize those two things. In other words, getting rejected and accepted and being edited by editors will make your writing a lot better. It's just that you can't rush the beginning. Pro if, if, you, if you're not lucky and, and, and start publishing right out of the gate, you just really need to be to be very patient and perfect your writing as much as you can, rather than be constantly worried about who's who you're submitting it to. And I know it's really difficult. It's easy to say. But that I think there's some truth to that. Is if you rely, if you work on your writing above everything else, everything else will ultimately take care of itself as you go along. I like that. Yeah, and I, I think that's that's a really good note for people who are, are who might be listening, who are new at writing and who have just started um, with the hopes of being published. Um, I know that like a lot yeah. of the time when I'm writing stuff, it feels more like um, I don't know, just dealing with my own like brain stuff and so I can actually like get it out um, and I like sharing it a lot but the publishing aspect of it is not that's not super high for me on like the priority aspect just because I don't know I don't know why I honestly don't know why like I, it, it would be cool and it would be great and of course I would love to see like a million books with my name and everything like that like anybody would um, but also I think the idea of people being able to read it and just tell me what they think of it like that's still so new for me and being able to grow and learn from every every person who gives me feedback, that's still such a new thing that I'm like, oh, this is so cool. Or oh, like, oh my God, I'm too soft for this. I'm not ready. Like, I don't know if I can hear this yet. Um, so it's, uh, I think that's really, it's really good that there's like this fostering of like encouragement for people who are just writing to write, not necessarily because they want to make a living off of it or because they want to be published in like have a book in Barnes and Noble, like some folks who have a lot of books <laughs> in Barnes and Noble. Um, that's not necessarily what you have to do. And I think that's really, that's really cool of you to say and like kind of, I don't know, validate for people. Good. I believe that wholeheartedly that writing for me, writing to write is the critical part. I'm just lucky enough to be able to sell, to sell stuff, but I never lose sight of the fact that they're separate uh, endeavors. No, not yeah, for sure. And it's, it's really cool that you don't seem to lose sight of who you were when you first started too. Like you seem very aware of how far you've come and you're like, no, like this is how this started. Like it wasn't always like this, which some people do over time lose sight of that. And they're like, no, like, I mean, I can't speak for any of the super famous writers out right now, but I'm sure that there are some out there who are like, I am this person and I am like the end all be all and I'm awesome now. Anybody would love me. And that's no matter how famous you are, that's not going to be true. So I think it's cool to remember where you came from at all times. Agreed. Agreed. I don't have a question. That was just... <laughs> For um for me, it took me six years until I got published. I got a lot of rejections. I got a lot of advice. So I'm right <coughs> there. I'm right there with you. Where it takes it takes time. I mean, I'm always trying to get better. You 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 should always strive for that. So yeah, I echo what Cassie said. That's that's great advice. Um, I want to go back to finished stories. Walking back to it, uh, I don't have one where it held off for 15 years but i did have similar scenario where last november 
2019 um, for NaNoWriMo. That was my first time that I tried that. I was like, you know, why not? And I had this screenplay that I wrote when I was uh, 13 to 16. It took me three years to write this slasher screenplay. And I'm like, I like it. I want to see it into a book. I finally did it. And 13 years later, I'm like, it's a while, you know, but it, it felt right and it flew out of me. So I I haven't heard anyone else say that before on this show. So I think that's also important to kind of point out that you shouldn't rush it. Um, the writer of Mad Men, he's, he, I listened to an interview with him and he was saying how he had, um, he wrote the, you know, the first pilot, kept it in his briefcase, brought it with him everywhere. It took him seven years to sell it. And that it's, he emphasized that it's, it's more important to not say, if I don't sell it by this date, I'm a failure. Because you don't know when that date is. That's right. Um, I'd like to talk about something that you've brought up. I think I heard you mention it on Ink Heist, but I can't recall precisely if that was it. But uh, Slush Piles. I've heard you say that Slush Pile reading was a pretty much a critical point in uh, your development as a writer. Um, it, am, I mis- am I misremembering that? Uh, I'm not sure what I... I've talked about uh, Slush Piles. I'm not sure if I said it was critical or not. But I okay. mean, I don't want to put words a, in your mouth. Well, I don't recall that. I, I could have, or maybe I said something like that. Before we go yeah. on, though, if, if I may... Oh, yeah, where, yeah, of course. I think, we, where are you guys uh, beaming in from? I'm in the uh, Rondout Valley, which is in the kind of upper, middle to upper Hudson Valley, uh, a couple hours north of New York. I'm out in the country near the oh, okay. Catskills. Where, where are you guys at? Um, I'm in South Jersey. I am right between Philly and uh, Lake City. So I'm I'm a lot closer to you than Cassie is. No, yeah, right. I'm in California. I'm near Sacramento. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I just, uh, yeah, I just, I was curious about that. Uh, uh, I live near, uh, actually, I live near closest for the author that all of us, I think you, I would assume you know him too, Tim Meyer. He, I, I think he's the closest author of horror authors that. Uh, Tim Meyer, I, I don't think we've met. Uh, he doesn't, if I'm, boy, I don't want to like show my ignorance too much, but did he write, uh, does he write Lovecraftian horror, I think, or some kind of something like that? Um, yeah, I wouldn't. So, I mean, he, I was going to say he writes horror. Um, I don't really know <laughs> if I've heard him described as Lovecraftian. I make, I'm think I'm showing my ignorance on that too. Uh, well, I, he, he just came out with dead daughters through silver shamrock. Okay, nope, that's not the guy. There's another Meyer who wrote for, he's a few years older than I am. I know he lives in New York uh, State. But so I haven't read Tim. Or, 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 okay. Tim. I, have yep. not, I haven't read him, I don't think. Oh, okay. So, sorry, sorry, can I, what is a, sorry, I'm going to go just back and show my ignorance here. What's a slush pile? What does that mean? We, we, right, we can go back to that. That's, uh, we can talk I'm about just, slush I'm piles. I'm just confused and I don't know what it is. No, that's a great, that, that's, I assume that everyone did and I didn't know what that was a while ago, so. It's a good question. Yeah, I'll, I'll take it, I guess. The slush pile is at, um, it's basically a reading pile or submission pile at magazines. That's what They called it the slush back in the day. And I'm not sure about the etymology or the, like the origins of it, but essentially what it is, let's say you submit uh, your your story to fantasy, the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. Uh, if they don't know, if they know who you are, like if you publish with them before, a lot of times it'll go directly to the editor's desk. But if they don't know know you, then it goes into just a general. They get this big pile of mail every week, and it's a, they call it the slush pile. And I'm not sure why it's called. I guess it's the overflow. And usually, some long suffering assistant uh, assistant will be going through and and reading the first paragraph of every one of these stories and deciding, well, should I read any more? And they'll make a little pile over here, and, and they all have a different. Like some of them, are, I'm like three sentences. Somebody like John Joseph Adams, I think, was two pages. Uh, and what they do is that they sort them into the nope pile, and then there's the maybe pile. And the maybe pile, obviously, some of those go upstairs. They get kicked up to the person who actually acquires. But that's that's what we're talking about when we talk about slush. It's just this. It's the it's like cold calling. You're cold calling the the cust, you know, the, the potential customer and trying to sell your wares to them. They didn't they didn't invite you. That sounds like a cool job to be able to like. I don't know. Oh, yeah. sounds, like very like. I don't know, godlike. Like I'm like, yes, you pass. And no, you do not pass. <laughs> Lots of angry people. Yeah. 
Just like, uh, you know, you, cr- those... you crushed my dreams. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would feel so bad too. I'd be like, you guys can all go, please go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> you feel, you feel bad for about a day. And then you that's fair. That. Yeah, that's totally fair. Your mercy would become a thing of the past. I would become hardened. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cruel, perhaps. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. I don't know. But you I definitely wouldn't. Like you that. definitely wouldn't be um, sentimental about it, though. It, it it drains that out of you. And I, I've only done verse of it for um, like best of anthologies, and I also I edited a poetry uh, online poetry, you know, easy many many years ago, and I so I read, and also I guessed. I I, I didn't edit, but I guessed acquired uh, for the fiction editor for a while. So I've had I've had my share of it. But definitely not like hardcore year after year, like John Joseph Adams did or something like that. I forget what we were talking about before we said where we live. <laughs> this, this is what we're talking about. Yeah, you we're just this. having a conversation, yeah. Pat. <laughs> oh, my, sorry, my bad. I thought so I wanted, okay. I wanted to actually ask you. So you mentioned the poetry thing because uh, I noticed that when you were talking about like the writing and stuff like that, the poetry <laughs> one wasn't mentioned as much as like the crime or horror or fantasy. So how was that? Um, because that's very different. Not everybody who goes into genre writing and just writing in general does poetry as well. So what got you into doing that sort of thing? I wrote poetry as a child. And I actually, that was the, to be honest, although I I don't recall getting paid. So, but my first publications, professional publications, or I shouldn't say professional, but they were in the local Anchorage paper up in Alaska, which had a circulation of, you know, tens of thousands. There's like 300,000 people living there and everybody, subscribe to it so I had a couple poems appear early on I always loved I always loved poetry I was a huge fan of like old we had encyclopedia or not encyclopedia but like the um I forget what the company put them out these sets of like treasury they call like a treasury of whatever and it's like Edgar Allan Poe you know a treasury of Edgar Allan Poe and I read a lot of Poe when I was when I was growing up and Robert, uh, Robert Service and people like that kind of the bit more base poets and mm. uh and then as I got older of course I got you know more sophisticated but I've always had this love of poetry and it goes right back to the novel versus the short novella versus the short story they're all related but different uh poetry didn't prepare me for prose but it certainly taught me it helped me develop my imagination and it helped me about develop more succinct and and striking word choice to do deploy and things like that and also it taught me, I think, I don't know if I've ever talked about this before. I think poetry and lyrics, the same thing, um, you know, like rock lyrics or whatever, taught me the importance of a title, um, which I think is a, not enough people pay attention to how important a title is. They go for the, oh, they're like, oh, this is a bombastic title or something, or this title is really on the nose and it's really clever. But titles uh, can do a lot of lifting in a, in a short story, especially. They, they're like added content. You can lit- I just literally, I had a story up here. Um, uh, D- Teresa DeLucci took it for uh, Join Us by the Campfire, Volume 2, uh, Joran Falls. And, she, and that, the, that, that, that phrase is mentioned once in the story, and only because I think Ellen made me put it, Ellen edited the story. She, I think she made me put it in there. But this, that title actually is the key to understanding the story. You probably won't understand what happened in the story unless you, and, she, and I remember her, I remember Ellen going, well, but, you know, should should that should the title have that much weight? You know, she, she it was a rhetorical question. She just wanting me to answer it for myself. And I said, we live in the era of Google. If they're too lazy to Google the title, they don't deserve to understand the story. She was flattered. <laughs> that is just I don't know if you can have that. I said, well, that's just how I feel about it. And she laughed and maybe put some stuff in <laughs> to clarify it just a slight <laughs> slightly, but not much. In that case, the title is actually crucial to understanding the story. Um, you don't have to, it's just, it, it, but it, it's a key. And I realized that in a lot of music, uh, for example, the title is a key for the, you know, for the musician will have a title that does not, a phrase that doesn't appear in the lyrics whatsoever, but it's a key into, into understanding what they meant by that song. The song will be about, you know, take skinheads bowling or something. But I mean, the, the bottom line is you'll have this title that doesn't appear. I can't think of anything off the top of my head, maybe synchronicity by the police or something. But um, where it's just, oh, this all comes together because I think that's what he meant over there. Or it re- or just more often it reinforces what's in the what's in the story. Um, but there's all these different ways you can you can deploy a title. 
uh, the obvious ways, but the not so obvious. I've, I've named many stories things that people go, why'd you name it that? I'm like, you need to read the story again and then go look up that title and then start figuring out. And I, <laughs> every time, so they'll come back and go, yeah, okay, I get it now. Uh, you know, and that's not something you want to do with novels, uh, especially for a big publishing house. They won't let you do that. But it's, it's a luxury of writing short fiction that you can, that you're pretty free to, to name your stories, what you want to name them. I think that's cool. And that's something too, I'm going to go like, look for now, especially when I'm reading your stories, I'm going to be like, Hmm, like how does this title apply to the actual story? And that's because of poetry. Poetry does that quite a bit too. Poetry very often will have no title. I shouldn't say often, but for, you know, frequently enough, if you read a lot of poetry, there's, there's titleless poetry, but there's also lots of poetry where there's no, there's no connection between the title and the poem, except maybe sonically. Or it's like abstract painting. It's a Jackson Pollock dripping. That maybe it doesn't really direct. It just puts you in a, a headspace. Everything's from how the the words sound in your head to how they're they're placed on the page. I mean, poetry. That's another thing poetry taught me. There's when somebody reads, you can't tell how or narrates a poem. You can't tell unless it's in front of you how it was arranged. But they a lot of poets are very meticulous about. E. e. Cummings, perfect example. You know, you'll have you'll have certain, uh, you know, a certain rhythm to how the, to how the words are appearing on the page. And then it'll be offset over here, another line. But if, yeah. when you hear him read it aloud, it just, he doesn't, there's actually no, there's actually no nuance. Uh, I'm not a linguist, but it doesn't appear to always be nuance. It's this, it's this deal about how it affects your brain chemistry, how it affects you neurologically when you, when you perceive it. And I really do feel that uh, that's something I got, that I got from poetry is that if you're clever, if you're clever, or, or writing with intent, it, it's like a little dose of something that I'm slipping into your in, into your mind. And yeah, um, yeah and I don't I don't even mean be clever, but I mean it's just it it actually does have a physical. There is a physical reaction that we have. Uh, it's the whole Skinner box thing, right? We're playing video games and doing the same freaking thing over and over for hundreds of hours, but you get a, a dopamine rush every time you hear the ding and you level up. I think that words on the page can do that to you as well. And I think the most subtle way you can do it, the most in your face and yet subtle way is a title. Because the title, it's in your face if it's bombastic, but it's subtle because you see it and you skip down and you start reading. In other words, we, it's expected. And so to me, the expected is when you can really fuck with people, uh, is when you come at them right in their face, right from the front. Right. Like, hi, I'm coming hand extended. I'm coming here to get you. And here's the knife in my other hand. You're just not you're not reacting to it because you're paralyzed. That, that would be one. That would be one example that it, it does something to that. It does something to your brain chemistry. Um, I don't know. You know, that's my perception of it. I, I don't know if that's true or not. I just it's how I feel about it. What about the. Uh... Remind me what the title is for one of your recent anthologies with Doug Morano. Oh, Miscreations, uh, Gods yep. and Monsters. And I had a... Yep, yep. Gods, Monstrosities, and Other Horrors. Yep. Right. Great anthology. I was, I've really been lucky. A lot of the anthologies I have been in are really good. Like, I enjoy was... read. But that's a great... That's a really great... That's, one. that's all. A, a plus. I think so. Can you please remind me what the title was? Because I know that it was like a tongue twister. Yeah, it's a it's 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 kind of a joke a joke title. Uh, Ode to Jode the Toad. <laughs> I think it's my well, only rhyming title. Is there <laughs> is there any meaning behind that? I have not read that to be clear. In case it's not obvious. Uh, the the ode part is is sort of doing some heavy. You know, is basically open to interpretation, but it's it is a, it's a fantasy story. So it's set in a high fantasy, Jack Vance, Michael Moorcock, Roger Zelazny when he's doing when he was doing fantasy. It's this alternate universe, alternate Earth, really. And there are creatures that very rare, but there are creatures that are archetypes of their species. In this case, it's a toad, and he's about the size of a grizzly bear, and he's a, a murder an assassin, and he can speak. In other words, he's anthropomorphized. So right. his name is his name is Joe. Or actually, his name is Neck, but the, he worships jo this this um, toad god, the god of slithering things called Jode. Oh, okay. Um, so, I mean, so it, it, yeah, it makes sense. <laughs> I I love the title though, man. Um, I'm gonna <laughs> take us back to when you used to live in Alaska. Uh, <laughs> you you told me a funny story. Well, I, 
Actually, I don't know why I said it was funny. You told me an interesting story about your brother and a, and a moose. So I, I'd like to he- actually hear it, if you don't mind. So you thought it was funny my brother got stomped by a moose? Nope, don't know why <gasps> no, I thought I'm, it was I'm funny. Just... <laughs> oh my gosh. Is that the one you're thinking of? That That's... is. Not a, I, someone, in that conversation, something was funny. I, I don't know what it was. I mean, we were brutal when I was a kid. You know, one of my uncles cut off his arm, essentially, when I was very young. And I remember um, he was he was using a chainsaw and he had a chainsaw accident. And his name was Ernest. And he he jumped in his rig and away was with him. And he was out in the country and he had to drive and drive for like an hour. And his arm was he just had to tie it off and they took the arm. And I remember everybody called him lefty after that. Like that was the cleverest. <laughs> everybody laughed. It was no mercy. It was, ha you know, uh, so for better or for worse, that's kind of how my family was, a bit extended family. But no, my brother, there's really not much of a story. It's just I think what I was talking about is how everybody in my family, but my, my immediate family, but my mother has been stomped by a moose. There was a, a video on Twitter about a moose blasting through neck deep snow. And it looks like the size of a small moving van. And it's literally leaving a, a snowmobile wake. Right. That everybody was talking about that. And I said, yeah. I said, you know, it could have stomped everybody and you know, there was a half a dozen people taking photos. It could have easily just gone through and stomped them all. The moose are pretty, pretty violent. They're pretty aggressive and they're very uh, agile. They're, they're fast and you're not going to outrun one. You're not going to hide behind a tree. They're, their knees go the opposite direction. So they kick, they can actually whip their, uh, like a reaching around a tree. They can like a bear. They can just reach around a tree and wallop you. Oh my God. And, and everybody in my family, my my two brothers and my dad and myself, have all been either stomped or flattened. I never got stomped. I got I got flattened by one, but the other three members of my family or the other men in my family uh, were stomped to some degree or another at one point throughout their Bro- careers. Broken bones or what? Was really got hurt. Like I think my dad might have got some ribs, but in the case, like in my case, the moose just it's it, the probably problem is you know. You're sharing, you're sharing space out in the woods with, in their living room, and we will put in trails, uh, you know, with snowshoes or snowmobiles or dog teams. And you have this really narrow trail that's like shoulder, you know, maybe slightly wider than your shoulders. And the dogs travel on it. It's hard. It's fast. You can travel it. You could literally drive a bicycle down a lot of those trails. But it's 12, 14 to 20 feet of snow on either side, you know. Uh, and you step off, you go immediately up to your neck. The moose cool. are like. He- they go, this, get, down, get out of my way. And they don't want to get out of the way all the time. And so they'll just run right over you. And hopefully you see them in the distance, you stop and you move aside. But sometimes you come around a corner and there's a moose. And that's what's pretty much happened to all of us. My my youngest brother, he he was stomped right in the yard. Um, so it happened like you know 20 feet from the house. What saved him though, is it was deep, deep snow. He saw it coming and he dove, dove off the trail. He was going to get firewood or something. He was probably... I want to say seven or eight and it it definitely it, it just it like a tent spike it just down it just <laughs> was just driving him in the snow and that was a little hat sticking up out of the snow and we were like oh you know got him right? we're one down but and the moose <laughs> ran and the moose ran off before my, my dad would have definitely done something drastic but the moose was gone like it just a little swamping thing and then just took off and my brother was fine we dug him out and he was just you know, sad, but he was okay. <laughs> nothing wrong with him. Um, the story is kind of funny now, after all. So I just want to say, maybe it's just in the way you're telling it. <laughs> it turned out fine. But it, it, it turned out fine. I would have laughed if it would have done worse, probably, but he didn't. So I didn't know he was that young. I just assumed he was older. Holy crap. Yeah, he, we all, we had, you know, you know what the thing is? It's just that when you, it's like anything else, right? If you, are out around dogs or wild, you know, any farm animals or around wild animals all the time. Sooner or later, you're going to get kicked or bitten or stomped, <laughs> gored. I mean, whatever. If you, if you, you know, if you play around long enough, that's what happens to you. And so it was just, you know, we weren't mad or anything. He was fine. No harm done. We just, you know, it was a young bull moose and he wasn't taking any guff. They don't usually what? come up and do that, but that was, that one did. What about like caribou? Are they an issue for, for things like that as well i don't know i would assume that the that there's in that there are circumstances that any animal will come at you Mm. they have a tendency to be far rarer at least where we were living there 
I've seen caribou up close. I've, I've eaten caribou. It's really good. Mm. I've admired them. Um, but generally they, they, they resided in places that were not, we weren't, we weren't where they, where they were. So I have a lot less experience with them. Uh, where I lived, the, the, the moose ruled, uh, the caribou were many, many, many miles away. I didn't know that moose weren't friendly. So if I, me being like the person that I am, if I went to Alaska and I saw a moose, I'd be like, oh, look how cute. And then I would get stomped into the snow. You'd be lucky if there's snow. Uh, now, <laughs> don't get me wrong. They're not, they're not like the great, you know, white sharks of the north. They're cruising around looking for people to stomp on. <laughs> Nine times out of 10, especially the summertime, they'll just leave. People mess with them all the time and they just leave. But they're they can be ornery and they can be ornery frequently enough they, they do a lot more damage to people than bear you know bears occasionally maul somebody or eat somebody moose stomp on somebody like frequently like it you know multiple times a year somebody gets kicked or stomped or run over by a moose so take that you know do that with what you will it's good to know <laughs> yeah do not go up and mess with them that's no. i they can kill you i'll see them from afar and like take a picture with the zoom function i think there you go yeah i, I that's my advice safety first <clears throat> oh okay me uh i did a rod i was curious about that can you, uh what was that experience like in is that a full-time job i don't know really anything about it yeah you know it's the sport has changed over the years ba back when i was a kid you gotta keep in mind this is the 70s and 80s when i was a mm -hmm. kid and i persist and i stuck with when i left home in the late 80s I stuck with, you know, sled dogs and that kind of living out in the woods and all that for like another five or six years. And then eventually I left. But it, for us and for actually most people that used to participate in uh, like racing and stuff, you know, hooking up a team and competing against other other teams, you know, anywhere from 50 miles to 1200 miles in the Iditarod was actually mostly just an expression of freighting. You know, a lot of people had dogs for, for travel. That's how you got around. Uh, there was, you're not walking 80 miles and you don't have a snowmobile. You, you know, you might have a dog team. And um, yeah, and then of course it started changing. By the time I got out of it in the mid 90s, well, early 90s, it had, it had kind of transitioned from something that a lot of natives were racing, you know, uh, indigenous Alaska, Alaskans were, were racing. People with, with their backyard, you know, just scruffy and spot you know, uh, these backyard kennels to something that very wealthy people, specialty bloodlines, people from Norway uh, or Scandinavia in general were coming over. And so that, so when I got out, it had transitioned from how yacht racing, or, or excuse me, how boat racing used to be, the America's Cup back in the ancient times when it first started. Anybody with a dinghy essentially could go out there and do it. And by the end, you know, these days, the America's Cup is a bunch of rich people with special, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a multi-billion, maybe even billion dollar operation. Wow. And so, so it changed over the years. I, I haven't been involved in it for over, well, 25 years now, 26 years now. So it's, you know, over half my life, I haven't, haven't been involved. But yeah, it, I would say that not so much racing the Iditarod, but just being with my dogs and training them had a lot of influence on my ability to, to be a consistent writer. And by that, it's because of the discipline. It's really, you know, writing every day, as you guys know, is not always fun. You, you're not living on adrenaline with your great idea. You're punching the keyboard going the, or the, or was, or, <laughs> and then deleting it. I, I always say, you know, I had a good day today. I deleted a thousand words. My, my girlfriend's always like, how many do you do today? I said, I deleted about a thousand. She's like, okay, that's, it's okay. I guess we're making progress. But, uh, <laughs> You know, and that's how and that's how training uh, do the dogs were. We go over the, you know, it's like marathon running. If you're going to go do a big race, 100 mile race, for example, you need to be doing 20, 30 mile runs all the time. And you're doing them over the same trails and everybody gets bored because you're seeing the same trails. The moose attack is like the exciting thing that happened. And so <laughs> what it taught me, though, is you go out there, no matter how you feel about it, if you're cold, tired, don't want to do it, get the sniffles today. I would still drag my, you know, dogs need to be taken care of. And that never ends. As far, that, that's what it's like with any farm. It doesn't matter how you feel. The animals, they, they're, they're not machines. You know, you don't, uh, they don't oil them, fuel them, and then, and then put them under a tarp. I mean, they're, you know, they're like us. They're like kids. Uh, you're taking care of them all the time. And so it taught me a certain level of responsibility. And it taught me 
some mental toughness. I think physically it probably destroyed me over the years just because I got pneumonia and stuff like that. But mm. uh, mentally, I think it made me a lot tougher. And of course, you know, I survived a couple incidents that I, I think have sort of, I don't know if they've affected my writing, but they, they certainly affect my, I don't give a fuck about titles, for example, or things like that. I'm like, no, nah, that thing that happened to me back in 93, I, I don't care about the little thing. You know, I care about the little things, but I don't, I don't obsess over, I don't worry about stuff, that kind of stuff anymore. Makes sense. Um, so I want to jump to conventions because I'm curious to hear how you started, which ones you started going to, uh, the evolution of your experience with them over the years. Man, and here's 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 back to advice, right? How should I put this? I think, and I and I, I don't really know. I'm in a weird position because I'm. I'm kind of like, you know, established, right? And so stuff that might be true for me now isn't necessarily true for Cassie or for you or somebody else who's earlier in their career, their evolution. So I don't want to I don't want to say anything like this is the end all be all. But I will say this. I think that I think the conventions can be a trap. And be careful about the trap aspect of conventions. I think conventions are hard on people who are not vivacious or can put on like I'm kind of, believe it or not, I'm sort of an introvert, but I can, like a performer, I can I can put on my I can put on my armor and I can go do my job. I can speak, I can hold forth. Not everybody can do that. Some people literally are paralyzed when they go to these conventions because they have um, imposter syndrome or they don't know anybody or they just don't don't do well. They're 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 heavily introverted or whatever. And so I think conventions can be a really bad first experience uh, for, uh, interacting with the writing community if you're not prepared. So um, we talked about this on Twitter. I talked to a lot of younger or new, I shouldn't say younger, newer writers about this, people who have not gone through this. Now, it doesn't matter how old you are. I don't care if you're 90. This could be a problem for you. And just said, you know, look me up at a convention. If you're feeling like you don't know anybody, I'll talk to you. Because it gives you this, there can be an esteem hit for people who are not, as as outgoing as others setting that aside though and, and also uh, conventions there are there are very rarely mean people or rude people but there are people who you have a tendency you haven't seen i haven't seen paul tremblay uh for you know two or three years and Stephen graham jones i'm gonna be hanging out with them and that's intimidating for somebody walking by who doesn't know us you see a group of people talking and they're not necessarily they might nod at you but they're not necessarily trying to freeze you out they're just they're hanging out they're, they're drinking see and so i think that i think that it's an easy trap to fall into is that this wasn't a fun you know that you're not worth talking to or you're not important or whatever that's not even that's not even remotely what's on people's minds and there are a handful of rude people but you'll you'll quickly re realize the difference between benign neglect and jerks and so i would say it is important it used to be important to go to them because editors are human beings and if an editor has two people and they got to pick one of their stories and they're both in their mind equal, but they've met Cassie, that might that might tip it in her favor. They will not buy something from Cassie or from you because they like you. But if it's all equal, it's human nature to go, oh, yeah, I, I met so to put a face to the to the story. And so while going to conventions will not at all assure you of of, of being published and not going will not cripple you. It's not a bad thing. It's just it's, it, what I look at is, is conventions are one more way to network and to, and to interact. And by network, I don't mean go and collect acquaintances, but I mean interact with people, make genuine friendships, make genuine connections. It shouldn't be hard. You're, we're all writers. Uh, and a lot of us in this field are kind of nerdy. So um, it's not a bad thing to do. And it used to be pretty vital. I don't with, with the supremacy of in, like what we're doing now. And also, I would say even now that COVID has changed the, the, the landscape, I really don't know what it's going to be like going forward. I'm not sure how critical it is. Like I said, from 2000 till about 2010, I thought it was critical to my career. Uh, I got so much work from, 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 from sitting there and having a drink with some editor. Sometimes I didn't even know them and just get to talking with them. And they're like, they didn't say, oh, I'll buy a story. They're like, send me a story. I have this 
anthology and it's invitation only, but go ahead and send me, go ahead and send me a story. And so the, the, the old conventions I went to, I used to go to Norwest con, which is in uh, outside of Seattle. It's a fan convention, like a media convention. So there's a lot of uh, movie, you know, actors and stuff. And then there's a literary track. And then as I got more and more um, established, I started going to reader con and um, that's a big, that's, that was always a good convention. And it was always a very serious convention, very, very small, about 200 people. And that's actually where I got a lot of my, of, of my work initially uh, is going to that, that convention. But I also just met tons of people. That's where I first met. Uh, I had corresponded with him, but I met John there for, laying in there for the first time. Paul Tremblay, you know, Nick Kaufman, you know, people that I knew from message boards at that time and email. But I'd never met. I, and they they went to the, that convention. I went to World Fantasy three times. I went to World Horror. Um, and the only thing I could say is, you know, these are all great. And of course, I've gone to Necron or ne uh, Necronomicon, which is every other year. I've gone to uh, Nikon, which is a fan kind of a fan convention. Or it's that's that's an odd one. That one is just for for writers and fans just to hang out. There's really uh, it's almost like a backyard barbecue that takes place over four days. So. I don't know if that answered the question. I just, I do feel like though it's really important not to get hung up on them or, twi or twisted because they can be really intimidating, especially I'll just throw them under the bus. World fantasy. World fantasy is not, I I'm not saying don't go to it if you don't have a book out or have written a bunch of stories, but that convention is intentionally icy to casual fans or new writers. It is expensive and it is, uh, it, it's basically one of those deals where it's very clickish and it's designed for business, essentially. Um, I, like I said, the first time I went, I had a book coming out and I already knew a bunch of people. And that was my secret weapon is that I had met at earlier conventions. I'd met enough people. I had people to hang out with. And I really do think that's critical for any of these. If you can try to have go to a convention and, and hopefully you'll have some people that you've met on Twitter or Facebook or something. I really, I really do think it's important because I have read so many really heartbreaking stories from people who go to these conventions who are, you know, uh, newer and just had a horrible time. And 90% of the time it wasn't because one person was a jerk. It was because they felt un unwanted and that's a bad feeling. Do you think then, so if you were giving tips to like somebody who's new, who was thinking about doing that, um, not specifically even to me because I have a lot of social anxiety. And so the idea of conventions makes me very nervous. Um, sure. but even just going to them to meet like my favorite <laughs> authors and stuff like that, that is like overwhelming for me. Um, but if you were giving people advice on like, if they were like, this is it, I'm going to do it. Um, you know, COVID's not a thing. I'm going to go like right. your top sort of advice pieces. It would be then to, try to know people beforehand if you can but then if they don't like would you say that they should just kind of like walk up to people and introduce right. themselves yeah you just walk right up and you know what um you belong I, I would go in with the idea that you belong there i don't care who you are i don't care if you're a writer um and 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 the jerks sort themselves out if you <laughs> if you go up and you you meet jerks i'm sorry that that happened but you know what then you you move on to the next there's very few jerks most people will be really sweet. And I would say over half of them will say, hey, have a chair, you know, sit down. Um, but just, you be you belong. Don't act like you belong there. You do belong there. <laughs> and if I could go back to myself, you know, the first couple of conventions I went to, I was just, I had no fun at all because I didn't know anybody. And I was really shy about walking up and talking to people. And talk to people. Authors love, ask, especially if you know who they are, you know anything about their writing. Uh, and obviously you're not gonna know everybody at a convention. But yeah, well, if you know about an author's writing, walk up. They'll tell you all about. It. Sure, tell me about your novel, and then you can just get you know walk off, get a drink, come back, and they're still going on. So there you <laughs> go. But uh, you you belong and uh, act like it, you know, or buy into that. That's that's important. That reminds me of a story that Todd Keeslin told me, man, where uh, he walked <laughs> up to his first one at Nikon in 2016, and Frank Michael Zarrington told him. He said, you're one of us. That's right. And that's, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I, I don't know how I was going to end that. I was just going to say that's he, he's a well-respected yep. reviewer for a reason. So that's a big deal. And to hear you say that, I hope that newer people to conventions, myself included, 
gets a reassurance that that should be the attitude. Well, I'll, I'll just tell you guys, you know, whomever's going to watch this, you know, down the road or is watching this. Um, obviously, there are times where people are doing something and you got to give them their space. But generally speaking, when writers are sitting around kibitzing, you know, in the con suite or they're out in the bar or whatever, I can tell you without reservation, me, John Langan, Paul Tremblay, I'll just those those three right there. Um, you walk up at any time, any time, and, and, and we will talk to you. That's not even... You know, so if you're ever worried or something, you recognize us, come up to us. You will be welcomed into the group. That's not even, you know, and we can introduce you to other people. That's actually one of the things like I'll give John. Uh, Paul does it, too, but I've watched John do it. John will take people who know no one. And he, once he figures that out, he'll introduce them to everybody he can. This is my friend, you know, Patrick or whomever. This is my buddy, Laird. You know, this is what we do. So if, if you take. I don't know what good advice I have, but if you ever see me or John or Paul at a convention, just come up to us, you know, and say hi. Cassie, you heard it. Laird said I'm his buddy. <laughs> no, I heard it. I heard it. Yeah. No, it's that's a guarantee for your money back. You're not you will not be turned away and you will that's be treated awesome, though. like our friend. That's that is good to know. Yeah. And I and I know there's other writers. I could if I started thinking about it, there are a bunch of other writers that I, I would I would say as well. I just I'm very close to those two guys and we've had this conversation. And we're very adamant about that. I think we've become more and more conscious of just how tough it is. I have. I know John has because I talked to him about it recently. That that interacting socially can be dicey. And oh, and there's a whole lot of, um, you know, I don't belong here. Who am I? And that's just, you know, um, I, I understand that because I felt that way, too. If I were to go to a crime convention, I, don't, I know very few uh, crime authors. I guarantee you I would be nervous. I don't you know, I don't I don't know anybody. But, um, you know, uh, it, it's just a tough thing to go through. It is. So um, that was something that you said actually made me think. Um, <clears throat> So since you've been doing this for a while, like you said, you've got a lot of experience. I want to know um, your experience with how using, because you mentioned message boards at first and like how you guys used to talk. How has it changed like through social media over the years and as a writer? Like how do you use social media differently now than you did before? I used to use social media. It was just, it was, it was just hobbyist. You know, I used it to actually, I, I made a bunch of friends like Nick Kaufman was somebody I could toss out there, great horror, horror writer, a good person. Um, he was one of the first people I met. And I, and I remember seeing him in person at World Horror Convention in 2006. And what a relief, because he was one of the only people that I knew. And I knew him from the message board. But um, back then, it was just pretty much just, to, you know, kibitz. These days, there is still that element. Uh, I personally am at the point where I just use, like, Twitter. Two reasons. One, I'm not allowed not to have a Twitter presence. That's just... <laughs> You know, my my agents would would have a heart attack. I shouldn't say they would have a heart attack, but they wouldn't be pleased if I just you know did not have a presence to 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 vaunt on social media. But I have a tendency to use it very little for what what it's really intended for these days, which is promotion. Because I figure the best promotion is just be you know, bitching about the political today or talking <laughs> about your favorite football team or talking about books you read. I mean, nothing has gotten me to read other writers more quickly than than I I jive with their um, their taste in music or literature or whatever it is. In other words, I, I've read people and, and said, wow, we both like the same band. I wonder what their writing is like, blah, blah, blah. I very, I've very seldom been swayed to ever pick up anything because someone was flogging it on social media. And I, and I don't, I'm not they saying that. I'm just, my reaction to it as a fellow writer is I don't. The more you tell me about your thing, the less likely, the more likely I'm just going to zone it out. Um, you're not going to convince me to buy your book because you, 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 tweet, you retweeted, you know, a sale on it every two hours. But, and I do think a lot of people are not very savvy with how they use it because they just... There's few ways to use it right, but there's lots of ways to use it wrong. And I, I just feel like a lot of people use it to vlog. And for me, I pretty much just use it to interact with my readers and my colleagues and to, you know, tell uh, Josh Hawley what I think of his his voting uh, practices, you know, things <laughs> like that or whomever. It could be any of these guys. But um, back in the day, 
it was pretty much just it was it was almost I won't say formal, but I feel like in the mid aughts it was just it was for just like having flame wars or um, joke threads and stuff. There's a there's a real self awareness now of a of branding and things like that, which I don't another thing I don't really agree with, but at least not for myself, it's not my preference. But yeah, there is a there is a huge self awareness that has crept in, and rightfully so. One false move on social media, and you're you know you, you might open up a can of worms that you can't close again. Uh, I don't necessarily believe that lots of people have had their careers ruined for saying the wrong thing, but I have seen daily people deleting shit they said because yeah, that was not really a a wise thing to say. Um, so the self awareness part. Back in the day, nobody cared. Nobody cared. They put anything on the message board. Um, these days amongst professionals, I think, or people that are uh, posting under their real names and have, and have, and have jobs and whatnot, employers who might care what they're tweeting. I do see a lot, a lot more self-awareness. Yeah. The, uh, one of the worst ways I've seen people using how to promote their work. And I'm guilty of this too. When I, the only time I self-publish when I started writing, you just start cold calling. You spam it. You you, you have no interactions with people. Uh, that's pretty much an instant. I need to get you uh, away from me right away. <laughs> that's like an instant mute when you're like, I have that so often. Like, I'll post a selfie or something, and somebody is like, Hey, I heard you like rainbows. My book has a rainbow cover. Do you want to read it? And I was like, I wasn't even talking about books here. Come on, man. <laughs> I mentioned rainbow on page three hundred. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I read Gravity's Rainbow. It's wild. It is so wild. The, and I, you see that a lot. And so I thought that that's why I asked you specifically about social media, because I did notice that you do post a lot of stuff. I mean, it, a lot recently, especially like a lot of political stuff, but you just, you don't self promote a lot yourself. Like you're not posting your book. You're not saying, here's my stuff, read it. You're not saying, here's my short story and the latest thing, which and I'm not knocking. I mean, you, you guys have all seen my stuff. Like I, I post a million self promo things a day, so I'm not knocking anybody who does that, but I, I thought it was interesting that it was a different approach that you do. Yeah, I'm, well, here's the thing. I, you have a duty, an obligation to your publisher to help them sell the book. It's just a question of what is going to help them and yourself the mo and the fans to see it. So to me, there's this line. If I have a new story coming out, I'm going to say, hey, I got a new story coming out. There's nothing. I like to see that. When, when, when one of my, um, you know, mutuals on, on, on Twitter says, hey, my new, my new story is in whatever anthology. I want to hear that. Mm -hmm. I, I don't knock people for periodically. I don't care if it's even once a day mentioning that they got something new coming out. That You should. You owe it to your, you know, there's a lot, there's a fine line, but, but you absolutely, you know, you're not doing anybody any favors by never mentioning that you have things for sale. It's just that I think a lot of times, you know, you just, there's a difference between advertising and spam mm -hmm. and the bottom line is like i have a lot of companies that i like i don't mind when they send me the occasional hey there's a sale on something but you do it two three four times a day and i start going well, you know that's too much and admittedly everybody's got a different threshold but i but i do think that you know every, we all have a concept of what our of what our threshold for spam is but we all agree on there is some threshold and so my feeling about it is just how i do it is if i have a new book out I will. There's a there's a there's a window for when they get the most sales. You're going to hear about my book, but you're going to hear about it in the context of, oh, look, there's an interview or this is a review. Like there might be something else just beside buy the book. There may be some content there. And then after that, you're not going to hear about it. I don't advertise Worse Angels at all. I will occasionally if it's on sale or there's a new review. And that's a new book that's eight months old. Uh, that's how I do it. I don't feel like anybody really needs me. Cause I, cause I also feel like if you're if you're interested in me and my writing, me mentioning periodically that I have something is is all the uh, is all the uh, notification that you really need. Uh, you don't need me trumpeting, you know, that I have that I have something. But I also have another philosophy about it. It has nothing to do. It doesn't align with marketing. What, what marketers will tell you. I believe in the thing called the long tail. Uh, tail is in like a dog swishing its tail, his or her tail. Um, people. <laughs> take years to catch up to you unless you're a best-selling author or you're lucky in that they heard about your book. And so they decided to read it first thing. You know what really happens to my books, for example, and I've completely at peace with this, except for when I was kind of breaking out into the mainstream with the crime novels. And so people were buying them at airports and reading them on a plane. Generally speaking throughout my career, someone will buy one of my books and they will read it 
three months later, nine months later, three years later. I have lots of people who are just now reviewing my first book and they would go, yeah, I bought this 10 years ago. I just never read it because they have a pile of books. And it's one of those things that people don't like to admit, but this is most people don't, unless they just read a couple of books a year in our field, horror, science fiction, fantasy, most readers don't read once a year or twice. They don't have their big three. They read, they read a lot. Well, you think, well, that means that they're going to get to you. No, they buy a lot. <laughs> they borrow, steal, appropriate a lot. They have piles. I have books that I have, it's taken me seven to eight years to get to. I just never got around to it because you know what? I kept piling more books on and then I kept, oh, this thing and that thing. So here's here's the deal. For me, sustainability is the is the key. I'm not a best-selling author. I probably never will be. But I'm an author who my books are all in print. Everything I've ever done, as far as I know, is still in print right now, which is pretty rare. And my go sequence is 13 years old for a book from, a, at the time, a small press to still be in print all these years later and getting new printings periodically. That's great. It doesn't sell thousands of copies every year, but it sells at least hundreds. And what that means is I'm I'm making money not on, hey, everybody, buy my book. Get out there and buy the book. I'm making money on, hey, you should try Laird Barron. Here's his catalog. And somebody who's never read me goes and goes, oh, I'll pick these three books that he wrote many years ago, and then maybe I'll buy his new book. And that's and so that's how my my philosophy about uh, about publishing, the, the publishing side of it. Yes, when a book first comes out or a story, due diligence, tell everybody, make sure everybody gets the word because there'll be a bunch of say, you know, impulse sales and things like that. But in general, I don't flog it because I want you, I want to be that guy that just that people read. And whether they're reading my new book or whether they're reading an old one. And so far that's kind of been my career, is just that I'm a you know established horror author who has a, a growing catalog. And I, it's, it's kind of like if you have a hardware store, you know, not to be crude, but you're selling hammers or whatever. You're not, you know, unless you're doing a sale, you're not worried about how many hammers you sold today. You always got hammers and they come by and they go, yeah, I was in the market for a hammer. And that's very much how I'm how, how I approach it. And it's, it's a big relief because I'm not uh, the publishing side of it does not interest me one bit. It just allows me to keep doing the thing that I like. And that is writing the stories. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, uh, Cassie, sorry, I jumped in. Uh, did you have any other follow-ups to this? No, no, I no, I he answered all of my questions. Oh, okay, that was a good answer. Yeah, I think it's interesting, and it's it's just it's cool because I think uh, I think my experience is more so, or my involvement, my interactions are with a lot of newer authors or um, indie authors who don't work with big publishers or, you know, who self publish. And so I can see, I can see how your, um, the way that you do it works for you. And I can see how that makes sense, especially over the long term, like you're saying, and you have a whole backlog of work. And then I can also on the same hand, see how for, you know, some of the people that I see who are like, Oh, I have this book coming out and then they continue to promote it for like the next couple months. Cause that's their only book so far. Absolutely. And so, yeah, I, I, I do not, I've said it. I'm sure you guys take me at my word. I don't presume to be correct here. This is this is like how I how I interact with it. Somebody mm -hmm. else might have great and how I react to what people do. That doesn't like I don't like uh, having you know my threshold for spam. Somebody else is like, oh thank God I that was like the tenth time it got retweeted and that's the one that I noticed. That <laughs> it's true though. I'm not being sarcastic. That that is how other people. So don't. This is not gospel. This is just my why I do what I do. Mm -hmm. The only thing I will say that maybe that maybe something to think about. And this is even for independent authors. I just don't know if there's any way around it. I've had more than one agent who knows what they're doing and more than one publicist tell me you, unless you're supremely gifted or you have money to advertise, you know, in other words, but if you just say you're Joe Blow, you know, just unknown author who has no specific skills, you're just trying to get your stuff out there. It's a fool's errand to promote yourself, um, over promote yourself because the bottom line is it. They don't, this is not what I'm saying. This is what they're saying. That the true promotion isn't you promoting yourself, it's other people promoting you. Yeah. So in other words, and, you, and I, have, I have seen some, some truth to this, that people who are independent, independently uh, publishing or, or just don't have a lot of stuff to sell, so they don't have a lot of name recognition, get that name recognition by being interesting people on social media. In other words, they provide content. They, yeah. they have a blog. They and they talk about things and they find an audience, Th then they can promote their stuff to the cows come home. 
Uh, I've noticed that that does work. That that that's a that's an interesting way to get your fiction sold is to actually not try to sell your fiction. You are there. It's just that people. Like I said earlier, if I'm interested in somebody, I'm interested in everything about them. Like if I'm if I'm clicking with someone on you know uh, various interests, why wouldn't I be interested in what they write? I, they don't have to ask me to to check out their their writing as long as I as long as they have a link to their you know, to, to their Amazon page or their website or whatever it is. So that's the only thing I would say. I, I think I totally agree with you, Cassie, that it's definitely not, there's not like one way. There's not a true path. I. It's just that I have been told though, that if you can, and maybe you don't have the option. See, that's the other thing is when you don't have an option, what are you supposed to do? But if you, you know, if you can get other people, the trick is to get other people to be interested enough to promote you. Um, that that will do do a lot more for you than you trying to drag the cart yourself. For sure. Yeah. No, and I definitely agree with that. And just because so I've been um I've been a blogger for like 10 years before I decided to ever try like writing or anything. And I I review books and stuff. So I can speak for that. That like there there have been a lot of authors that I've worked with who were like, hey, look, this is my first book. Like I I don't have anything written, but do you think like I could send you a review copy for consideration and maybe if you like it, you can review it and tell people about it. And you know, I've done it and I've, I've seen firsthand right. people buy it and say like, wow, like I would not have heard about this. This is awesome. And then, you know, seen it gain clout and they put out more books. And I see that all the time. Like there are a lot of other review websites, a lot of other bloggers and stuff. And so, like you said, that's, that's a really good thing. Um, and I can also speak for the fact that if you have something flashy, like rainbow hair, for example, people do <laughs> tend to, at least they not, you know, by your writing or anything specifically, but just they do tend to gravitate toward you to want to get to know more. Um, right. And then sometimes it's a trick like me where I'm just very shy and awkward. And I'm like, oh, God, like that was a trap. Now <laughs> you've been pulled <laughs> in. So um, but I mean, for other people who like, um, for example, like Adam Caesar, he does like a, a video uh, oh, yeah. on YouTube. Yeah. And so he has this whole thing with movies and all of his stuff that he likes. And it's like he writes and I love his books, but also I really like the all the other stuff that he's into, like video games and or the, like the board games and stuff and like just different nerdy things. I think that appeals too. And I think that's true for a lot of people. A lot of readers, they're like, I want to know the person behind the book. And yeah. Right. He's really a nice guy, a great writer. Yes. And I also think that what he does is really, and like, once again, it's his thing, right? But I do think it's really effective because I never get the impression, even when he had that, uh, his book earlier, uh, I guess it was earlier this year, but it's, it seemed like 10 years ago. I know. <laughs> but, you know, was it Clown in a, in a Cornfield? Mm -hmm. That's important. That was a big publisher, a big moment in his life. And he, he did promote it, but he promoted it with, I thought, really restraint and very classy. And he could get away with doing what he wants to do with it because he has for years been like, hey, here's what I think of it. In other words, I hate to use the word content, but for years he hasn't been barraging people with advertising. You go re, you go because he's funny and he's insightful and he has something to say about a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna go learn something or I'm gonna I'm gonna get some wisdom laid on me about uh, you know about this movie or whatever. And I think that's the way to me, if you can do that, that's a really good way, you know, a good way to do it is just to be, you're not there to try to to vlog your stuff, you're there because you're interacting with the community, and and yes, you happen to be a craftsman or craftswoman or craftsperson. You know, the <laughs> bottom line is you you have a living to make, but you're not there to try to like make it off people. And I think that's really, I think for most of us, that's a critical point to keep in mind. Yeah, it's it's a hard line to straddle, but I think it's an important one to learn how to do it. Right. And that's precisely was my aim for this show. Is yeah, we want to promote your stuff, but I mean. Think about what we've talked about just in this episode alone. We've talked about you, your past, where you've lived, where you live now. Um, because it, if I'm listening to this for the first time, I'm like, okay, Alaska, I don't know really any other authors from there. And then uh, I hear, okay, I hear about Blood Standard. Okay, then I hear about his short stories and how they're different. Uh, there's an, I'm not saying it's about myself. There's an art to what you have talked about for the last, what, 10 minutes or so about being uh calculating with how you present yourself because if you just go up to someone and there's no internet and you're just shouting at them buy this buy this you're gonna say get the fuck away from me <laughs> right um now we're kind of wrapping up now um so i i got just a few final questions sure. and if there's anything at the end that you'd like to talk about please do so um but I'm curious, what are you reading right now? Oh, 
I'm glad you asked that because I get to talk about some good authors. I just read a piece. Um, let's see here. Now I'm gonna. Now I'm gonna because I don't have my notes in front of me. Let's see. I, I recently I provided quotes for Clint Smith. Uh, he he wrote a collection called The Skeleton Melodies, uh, which came out this year. Super great gothic horror. I hate to say gothic, but there is sort of a gothic sensibility. Weird horror. That's excellent. Uh, I'm reading uh, uh, Bo Johnson, who's a crime writer with some real dark, like was very violent. He's awfully violent for a Canadian. Uh, but uh, oh, is that his upcoming uh, one for yeah, Down and Out? I, I, I guess I, it's a uh, it's a it's a it's a it's a collection. I'm reading that. I just read one called Brood, a novella. Actually, it's not a novella. It's probably a novelette, but it's it's on Amazon. I, it's it's being sold on Amazon by a small press. Uh, it's called Brood by Mark uh, Mark Anthony or, yeah Mark Anthony Smith, which is really weird, like a really psychedelic weird story. Mm. Uh, like I said, there's a guy named Pierce Hansen. I've forgotten the title. I think it's called In the Thick of Things, but it's Pierce Hansen. It's a very short story. It's a kind of an adventure horror story. It was maybe even a science fiction element. Pierce Hansen's somebody that I really that I really like. He's uh, you know, kind of a cult author and he writes a lot of uh, crime, but they have this weird, well, weird and horror inflection throughout them. So um and I can't really tell you who he reminds me of. He's like almost too generous. He has his own thing going. But <laughs> Pierce Hansen, if, if anybody listening, Pierce Hansen is a really interesting. He's got some stuff available on Amazon that I think was published through Tor or something years ago. But okay. really, uh, one of them was. I mean, he was affiliated with Tor um, at one time. I mean, this guy's a really great writer. It's just, you know, I don't think a lot of people have heard of him. Uh, and I've also been reading, um, um, actually, Let's see here. I just finished this. I'm sitting here. Lawrence Block, kind of one of his seminal oh, okay. scatter scatter stories. Uh, when the Sacred Gin Mill closes, uh, Mike Davis of Lovecraft Easy has been on my case for years to read it. He goes, well, have you ever read Block? And I said, well, as a kid, I read a lot of Block, but I don't remember specifics. I was a kid. I was like, I would read one of those in a day and then mm -hmm. beyond to the, to the Western. But he said, I don't think I ever read that particular one. He said, you've got to read that one. And for years, this has gone on. Finally, he sent it to me. And then I've had it for over a year. And I'm like, I finally, like the last, I started reading it you know, weeks ago. And I, with things going on in the world, I have not been able to concentrate. My own writing right. is suffering. So I right. finally got around to, I finally got around to reading it. It's just, you know, obviously it's a classic. So that's some of the stuff. Um, Oh, and Paul Bowles, that's um, somebody that I've really taken a deep dive into. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. Nope. He wrote uh, Beneath the Sheltering Sky back in the day. Um, very literary, English, like an expat uh, living in Morocco or wherever. And he was a great short fiction writer. Uh, and so he wrote this, one of his collections is called The Delicate Prey. And it's very literary and very dark and very mannered. But I would say it's more horrific than Clive Barker or uh, probably any Stephen King or anybody like that. Uh, really? writing. It's not a super, there's only a vague supernatural intrusions in a handful of his stories. But the horror, it's, it's more horrific than almost anything I've ever encountered. Especially when you read the collection, like there's 17 stories. So they're all fairly short with the exception mm -hmm. of a couple. Like he's a guy, you know, tell you a story in 10, 12 pages, no problem. They get their languid and they take their time. But when you read them, it's more than the sum of its parts. You aren't going to get the full effect of bowls by reading a story. You need to sit down and if you're interested and, and, and read, you know, half a dozen, half a dozen of them, or even just do the collection if you like it. And you, you, you know, you're, you'll have this disquieted sensation. Just, you know, you'll be disquieted uh, as I have been. I never really, I read uh, Beneath the Sheltering Sky when I was a kid, but I didn't really place him. I just got into his short fiction for real mm. this summer and it's still, you know, it still bothers me. I just got done with his collected work, which is basically all his stuff. It's, uh, it's, it's pretty smashing um, in the sense of the British sense, but also what it does to your, your psyche. It really, I, I don't know that you want to sit there and read a whole book, but you definitely, if you delve into him a bit, you're going to, especially as an author, it's going to, it's going to work some kind of chemical changes on you. Wow. Interesting. Uh, yeah. Cassie, what are, what are you reading? Um, so, well, first, I'm just going to say I'm glad that you said that 
you've had trouble focusing recently reading because mm. same and that makes me feel better because it's been so hard like the last like year or so um I have to force it I have to like sit down and be like okay like don't talk to me to my boyfriend and I'm like keep the dogs like I have to focus on this and like not do anything else and also I have to leave my phone in another room because I'm terrible like I'll just check Twitter <laughs> without even realizing I'm checking Twitter um okay but so recently the most recent thing I think the book that I read was um Come Closer by Sarah Grant mm. um it was the one about like possession and stuff which I thought was cool um it's not super long um and I think that that's helped me a lot with novella length things like I've been able to get through them um short story collections too I've been trying to read like a couple of short stories in a different collection every night um so it's been working out but sometimes then it's like oh wait which collection did this belong to and so I think I should probably stick to one um and then aside from that I think I finished Fanged Dandelion by um Eric I don't know if you say his name La Roca or La Roca but oh that's you know what I'm th glad you mentioned him not to Step on no. that. I'm actually reading. A, I'm reading uh, a manuscript by him as well. Oh, what are you? Are you what are you reading? It's it's. Uh, actually, I don't have the title right in front of me. But um, actually, I don't have it in front of me. It's 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 a long title. Um, wish I could find it. I'd have to dig through my files. Is it one I've that he already a, came out with, or one that he's? No, out? no, no, no. It's a manuscript. Oh, oh, oh. So fact, wait a minute. Hold on. Oh, you know, I don't know the title is because it's. Um, he has it. He doesn't. It's not a formatted manuscript. It's and it's TSTWB. The and I guess I can't remember the shadows or something. So there's no. I haven't run into the story that 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 takes that title. But there's no actual title. It's just a bunch of an uh, like it's like an acronym. Oh, but okay. so I'm just I'm just slowly getting into that. And I've read like the first two stories. So mm -hmm. that's really yeah. I'm interested. But you know, uh, I might quote that. I might I might give a quote for that. You know, the problem is I get I get lots and lots of manuscripts, and so it turns into. What what can I quote that I feel like I can quote, but also just how many have I done? I can't, I can only do. But anyway, so back to what you were saying, sorry. No, no, no. I thought that was interesting because I, I do also, um, I see a lot of people asking about like blurbs and stuff or like people posting them for other people. And I'm always like, how does that happen? Like, do they just ask them to do they it? Just, that's that's wild. That's, can, yeah. we, can we focus on that real quick? Because I, I, I've heard <laughs> other authors, not to interrupt you, Cassie, but I'd be very interested to hear. First off, what the frequency is with how uh often people ask you and just what your threshold is i'll i'll use that word what's your threat threshold per per year if you will let me oh, absolutely cassie why don't you finish uh your thought and i'll and i'll go into that oh i just the poetry collection is really good it's my first time reading anything <laughs> by him so so it's my oh. it's my first brush with his like writing and i was like oh this is really nice so that's the, so so his so you're reading something different than I am, okay? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a, the poetry collection. So it was published by I think it's um Domain. Oh, oh, right, right. Yeah, and it's it's I didn't know what like I didn't know much going into it because I haven't read anything by him, but I'd seen a, a couple of other people post that he had had some books come out this last year that they liked, and so I saw that and I was like, oh, let me try to read it, and it, I really liked it. It was really good. There were a lot of quotes that I pulled uh, from it that I saved. So yeah, good. I, yeah. Domain well, publishing. Yeah. Okay. You said yeah, Demean. That's uh, I believe they're the ones that also published um, the the author I mentioned earlier that wrote Brood. Um, oh, really? Yeah. So uh, Smith. Yeah. So okay. Do the short shot, short sharp. Yes. Shot yes. Books. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yep. That's a weird story, you guys. I don't. I I, I sent him a little quote, but it's I, it's definitely not for everybody. But I do think it's worth reading uh, if you're a horror. Ooh, okay. horror reader. It's I bizarre. I did write it down. Yeah. It's bizarre. <laughs> you know. So. Um, Okay, so. Uh, so so moving on to the uh, before I go to well you know what, I'll just go to what I'm reading uh, real <laughs> quote real quick two books the gulp by Alan Baxter yeah, yeah, yeah. Alan Baxter that, rules he um, does I love him he's did you just, read the Rue I didn't read the Rue I, I I read his collections and a couple of his novels though and the guy is just like a whiskey drinking Vegemite munching kangaroo <laughs> punching you know he is. guy such I a like great guy mate mate. No, yeah. I just like him as him. I, I don't. I wouldn't care if his writing was, you know, if I didn't like his writing at all. But I happen to like his writing too. So no, that's that's awesome. Agreed. No, he is. He's a very good guy. And if you do read the Rue, you'll uh, you'll see a couple of familiar names pop up. <laughs> Me, Cassie, and Brennan are in it. We are. Die. I'm sure they die. Somebody dies. Maybe quite a, a few people, people die. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I interrupted you that time. <laughs> All good. I I deserve that. So the other one I'm bringing in, it's just a digital copy. Huh. It's 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 an awesome cover. It, yeah, that looks cool. 
I hate how it reflects off the screen. For audio listeners, I'm showing on the cover. Uh, it's called Je- um, Clementine's Awakening by Jennifer Sousey. It comes out, I hope I'm pronouncing that last name right. I don't know. Uh, it comes out in February of 2021. It's uh, Silver Shamrock. And uh, yeah, we're going to have her on at the end of February for Women in uh, Horror. But uh, it's I've only read the beginning of it. I like it. It's interesting. It's a big book from what I can tell. Uh, it's ebooks are weird like i can't i don't like how i can't see the pages i just see like the location i don't understand the pat the pattern of like going from one page to the next so it looks big uh but let's move on to the blurb thing because i'm really sure. curious about that yeah um it, just reiterate you're asking my friend oh yeah yeah sorry um this the free well you know obviously this is not going to be very helpful because it's just for pertains to me but oh, and also it, it changes uh i'm gonna be cagey about it because this is pretty personal this is actually the only personal thing that you guys have asked me um because everybody you know i would say everybody plenty of people you know really we, we are you know very inclined to get a blurb you know type of thing not just for me but from whomever you know can help them uh i i will only say this i'm not gonna put a number on it because that would be i, I can't you're not going to probably, I don't have any problem with people asking, but you're probably not going to get a blurb. And I don't mean that because it's not good enough or something like that. The biggest, the biggest uh, bar to getting a blurb for me and probably from a lot of writers is we can only do uh, logistically speaking, but also just saturation. You can only, you can only do so many. And I, I mean, I feel like I do way too many anyway. And I'm, I, I do one out of umpteen, umpteen uh, in a good year. I don't do very many. I just can't. Um, but it, it almost never comes down to. Uh, yeah, I've read stuff. I've read. I've read my share of things like I can't blurb this, or I decline because I didn't. It, it's not something I'll put my name on. But generally speaking, that's not the most people who ask me for a blurb these days. It's 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 colleague. It's a lot of colleagues whom I respect their work anyway and be happy like their work's good, um, or at least I, you know my, my preference. But the bottom line is I don't. I just can't. I have to say no most of the time. But and, and you know, in the, in the past, especially when I was on Facebook, I told people to stop asking me. I just flat out said, <laughs> well, because I was just getting so many. And I said, right. stop, do not ask me, go through my agent. And no one listened. So I just don't even bother anymore. I'm like, what I've become is just more, much more brutal with my time. I'm just like, I don't promise you anything. I'm just like, hey, I, you know, I'll read it, but you may not hear back from me. If you don't hear back, I'm not, I'm not blurbing. And that's just it. And uh, it's no, sure. nothing personal. And it's not a statement of quality. I literally, there's been stories. I, one year I got so many, um, cause I had, I think, oh, I think it was like beautiful thing had gotten up for awards or something. I literally had like 80 different authors over like a three month stretch asking for blurbs. Whoa. I could, how am I, what am I, even if I wanted to, I can't blurb all those books. So m- the vast majority have never even got, I never even got, I mean, I eventually read everything over the years, but most of them, I never even got to them. So, mm-hmm. um, I, you know, I'm me. I've heard Jeff Ford talk about, look, guys, I can give out three a year. I mean, I've heard number. Some authors will give you a number. They're like, I can only do a couple a year. And if you think if you're in this business for a long time, let's just say you did one a year, you're going to have 20 books out there with your, if you're in it for 20 years, 20 blurbs. And I've done way more than that. Like one year I give out seven or eight. And I'm like, I can't do that anymore. I just can't. Cool. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I don't have anything to add to that besides that, that makes sense. Uh, you, you got what two Shirley Jackson awards pretty early on. So I, yeah, I know that those awards, uh, they mean a lot to certain types, writers, editors, uh, pr- you know, publishers and whatnot. So yeah, uh, that's, that's, that could be infuriating. I would think for some people, um, I'm curious what you're currently working on or if you can and want to talk about any upcoming releases. Well, I don't think, uh, I'm not sure where this is coming out, but it was also, the beans were spilled by Titan. Uh, Ellen Datlow has a um, anthology. Uh, she has several anthologies in the in the works at all times, but she has one about Shirley, ja- you know, based on Shirley Jackson as a theme. Oh, wow. uh, and of course, it's coming out late this year, I guess. Mm-hmm. And I just, uh, I, I'm in that. I sold a story to her for that. And I, I will say this, it's always probably the wrong thing for a writer to say or an artist, but I think it made, it creeped me out more than almost any other story. I creep myself out a lot when I wrote the story. 
Wow. So I have a lot of, this story is really, I won't say it's personal, but it's a story that I really, you know, I'm, I'm, I always, I won't put on a story until I'm proud of it, but this one really uh, consumed me while I was writing it. And mm. of course, you know, if you know Ellen Datlow, these stories, these stories are not going to be these in this anthology won't be surely written like Shirley Jackson or about Shirley Jackson, maybe one or two. They're going to be stories that like incorporate her themes of paranoia or creeping dread or suburbia, you know, suburbia as a wilderness or whatever. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very much looking forward to having what I think is one of the best stories I've written since I started to be in this anthology, because I think this is going to be a really good anthology just based on what I've heard. That sounds yeah. amazing. Uh, and I hadn't actually heard of that. Do you know, um, are you allowed, like, what's the title? Or are you allowed to say, or do you know when exactly it's coming well, out? Like I said, I don't, I don't know when it's coming out. I hear the end of 2021. So like fall 2021, okay. uh, but this is directly from Titan. In other words, I'm not, they said this. Uh, and yeah. I think it's called, called when things get dark mm -hmm. okay. and then it's a subtitle, you know, but, but yes, when things get dark, and they've mentioned, you know, Paul Tremblay, for example, is somebody that's in it. There's a bunch of there's a bunch of big names in it, uh, very diverse. There's a lot of different people in it. Just from the and it wasn't completely like I don't think that they had announced all the names yet. They just announced a handful of them. But just based on what I've talked to her about and what I wrote and, and the names that she has in there and the subject, of course, the the theme, I, I I'm excited. I'm not always excited this way. This this is an anthology that I'm like, oh, this could be a very special anthology. So I'm, I hope it. I hope it. Fingers crossed. That's how it. That's how it goes down. Uh, and I'm. I, I don't have anything else coming out that I can talk about. I do have a lot of things that are going to come out though. Uh, I'm getting pretty close to wrapping up my next collection. Um, oh, nice. I don't know. I'm hoping that sometime this year I'll have it done. But you know, I probably wouldn't. Depending on. The problem with, se with selling a collection is if you have a couple stories you want, but they're under exclusivity contracts, like the story that I that I, I sold Ellen, I really wanted in the next collection, but you know I don't know if the timing will work, so I may have to wait. But I but I'm very close to wrapping it up, and I'm very far along in completing a collection of um, fantasy, like secondary secondary world fantasy horror stories, like a fairy tale kind of a, a setting, and. Um, that would be a couple more years, but I'm but I'm writing a bunch of stories for that. So that's I'm working I'm working on a stack of stories, and then I have a um, in that fantasy setting. I'm also working on slowly um, a novel. Fantastic, uh, Cassie. Before I ask the final question, do you have any other questions? No, I don't. I think we I asked everything. I rambled a lot. We're good. <laughs> uh, Larry. Do before uh, I ask the final question, is there anything that you want to cover? Any shout outs? Anything that you desire that we have not asked yet? Um, no, because I was able to mention a few a few writers uh, and stuff and express my gratitude toward my editors, as always. Um, I, I guess the only thing I would say is, is uh, you know, thanks for, you know, thanks for listening and or watching. OK, uh, yeah, great. Uh, I hope as many people as we've ever had a uh, watch and listen, because this is one of the first uh, episodes for season two. First time we'll have uh, the video that we've been recording for, I don't know, a long time, four or five months, maybe longer. So this is the first time that everyone's going to be able to see them. So it'll be interesting to see the uh, feedback on that. Um, final question is where can people follow you? You can follow me at uh, my website, my author site, uh, Laird Barron at wordpress.com. Uh, WordPress uh, you can also follow me on Twitter uh, under my name and Facebook under, under Laird Barron. Thank you, uh, Laird, for joining us. I appreciate you giving us nearly two hours of your time. It means a lot, man. Um, I'm excited for that anthology with Ellen. That sounds incredible. I can't wait until that comes out. Um, Cassie, thank you for joining us that you were going to be here regardless of uh brennan being here or not so i mean he'll hear this so for the sake of him not knowing this until he listens maybe you can replace him permanently shut up <laughs> get out of here <laughs> all listeners thank you for those just joining us in this season appreciate it hope you stick around hope you listen to the uh, first season check out laird's work it's excellent crime or horror and dark fantasy we encourage it Thank you for your time, and until next time, have a good one.